Uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you for uh, joining us today, uh, despite the sun and warm temperatures, uh, for this panel dedicated to uh, the limitations of artistic responses to the environmental issues. I'm accompanied today uh, by the artists Anaïta Norouzi, Giselle Trudel, and Stéphane Claude, who have in common to be the winners of the Grandham Foundation for the Art and the Environment Prize. In 2021, Anaïta, you were a resident at this, of this foundation created by two philanthropists, and this year I had the pleasure of curating your exhibition, showing the results of your investigations. You set out to find a so-called invasive plant, the Persian Ogwig, and eventually found another plant from which you constructed your visual narrative and several installations. Giselle Trudel and Stéphane Claude, you have the protean artistic practice that combines technological experimentation and interdisciplinary collaboration. In 1996, so it's a long time ago, you co-founded the artistic research cell eLab with you, Stéphane Claude, who is a composer and sound engineer, principal researcher of the audio area of the New Media Laboratory of the Art Montreal Artist Run Space overall. Together, you describe your practice uh, as experimental documentary combining analog and digital media with social engagement. Within the Canada Media Research Chair in Arts, Eco-Technologies of Practice and Climate Change, you have integrated the Pan-Canadian Scientific Research Program, Smart Forest, led at UCAM for, by forest ecologist Dan Nisha, and each year, to different communities, including that of Santin Monagontam. This scientific program deals with the effects of climate change on soils and forests in Quebec and Canada in order to propose artistic, scientific, and public dialogue to these challenges. And finally, I introduce myself. I'm an art historian, critic, and independent curator specializing in environmental issues since 20 years. Since uh, 2016, I'd focused my research and interest on the growing entanglement of knowledge and artworks with and in the Anthropocene and wrote essays, among others, on animal point of view and botanical agency. I curated the uh, exhibition Appear, Disappear, that inaugurated the Grantham Foundation for the Arts in 2019. And as I told previously, I collaborated with the foundation again at the occasion of Anaita's monograph in 2022, titled Troubled Garden Study for Migratory, Migratory Route. So this conversation will be held in French and in English, as the four of us are Francophones. I will mostly phrase my questions in English, but feel free to answer either in French or English. And please let us know uh, if one of you is is only English-speaking person will help you to understand our discussion. So we'll start with you, Anaïta. Um, most of your artistic research and productions investigates the roots and journeys of human diasporas. And progressively, you've been interested by the plants that migrant family uh, brings with them and affectionate as a reminder of the country and culinary culture. How do you discover your special relationship with this plant, considered here in Canada as invasive, that is Persian Ogwig? Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. It's a sunny, nice day outside, so being this dark. <laughs> um, so in 2017, I finally installed myself in Montreal as an immigrant. And um, my relationship to this new place was developed through time. Um, as any immigrant who tries to find their footing into the new place, I, um, I was looking into my environment, trying to find something familiar to encounter in myself into this new environment. And um, so, well, the, that was my encounter and the point of departure for the whole body of work that was developed through time, through the weeds that I saw in the back alleys in Montreal. Um, for me, these plants are really like evolutionary wonders in a sense that they grow in my country with 40 degrees heat in summer and here in minus 40 uh, <laughs> cold in winter. And 
also, it was interesting for me to think about the trajectory of these plants, how they found themselves here or they found themselves there. So that was the point of departure for a very long uh, research project that was developed through uh, the last three, four years, which was eventually resulted in the exhibition that I had in Grand Town Foundation. So when I was there, and when, before going to the, before starting the residency, I was thinking about the idea of how the, um, the plants, the weeds that we find in our environment kind of tells us about the population, the immigrant population in that, in, in that area or region. And when I started the residency, I came upon this um, plant called uh, hogweed. It's an umbrella term for a large family of the plants. You probably saw them. Uh, they have this, um, they are like two, three meters tall, and uh, you probably heard a lot about them in the, um, in the media as something that you should absolutely avoid because it burns the skin and uh, so many hysteria around this plant. Um, but for me, the twist was, uh, the twist that was, Interested to me, interesting to me was that I had so many memories with this plant. When I was a kid, I would um, hike in mountains around Tehran in the valleys, and um, I would pick the grain of this plant with my grandma, and we would make pickles with that, or we would use the grains as a spice to eat with yogurt or pomegranate. So for me, they had this um, kind of a cultural personal charge into it. And for me, what, it was interesting to think how this plant that is very appreciated in one culture can change to a monstrous present that should be absolutely eradicated in another side of the world, in another culture. And what this differentiation in categorizing this plant into weed means, what kind of um, power relationship it implicates to. So that was a departure point for me for a journey that I really loved and I learned a lot. The history of this plant, its displacement is um, absolutely fascinating. It was taken from Iran during the colonial era, uh, taken to uh, England as a trophy to be, um, to be uh, given to the fa uh, royal family. And the first time that it was documented in, uh, in the West, it was in the Buckingham Palace. So that kind of implies that it was given to the royal family to please them. And the problem started, and sorry, for um, more than 100 years, the, the seeds of this plant was sold in different... Um, Garden fair? Yeah, exactly, um, through the catalogs and uh, all over Europe and eventually it got to New York and then to Canada. And the problem started the moment that the plant started walking out of the gardens uh, by itself without humans' in intervention, which we don't like it, right? We want to have control over everything. So when it got out of the control in a sense that it started reproducing itself without the help of humans, uh, we started not liking it and having all these plans to eradicate it, but it was already out of control. And what is interesting also, uh, tell me if it is too long, <laughs> um, but what's, what is also interesting is that the plant actually changes itself biologically um, through this displacement. So we create a, a change to basically a biological, the DNA of the plant in a sense that this plant is, the sap of this plant is not as toxic as in Iran, in Iran we cultivate it, we eat it, we, um, we have farms of this plant. Here, uh, it creates a serious burn. So all these questions and all these differentiations between the two, it, they are not two different species, they are basically one species which turn to a more monstrous uh, defense mechanism. For me, it's very interesting to think about uh, because it tells us a lot about our actions, uh, the consequence of, consequences of our actions. Um, and also, when we intervene with this course of nature, uh, what can be, 
what can be the outcome. And uh, the surprising thing uh, during your journey uh, at Contem Foundation is that this invasive plan, the Persian Agwig, when you think about invasive, you think about invasion. So there, there, you think that there are plants everywhere. But in fact, it was really, really difficult to find this plant on the uh, Canadian soil, on the Ke uh, Quebecian soil. It was really difficult. You haven't seen the Persian Agwig, no. in fact. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's, that was also another aspect of this whole uh, idea about the weed and about the invasive plants. There is a lot of hysteria in the West uh, around it, especially in the, um, in the recent years. And I, I feel that the bigger is the plant, the, the, the bigger it becomes something monstrous in our head. So this, for me, there was a source of, sort of parallel between the idea of um, and the vocabulary that we use when we are talking about the new immigrants and the way that we talk about these invasive plants and the whole history around having this unknown other in our soil, uh, which is going to exploit our resources. For me, there are a lot of unfortunate similarities. So when I was before going there, I did a research if I can find this plant in this uh, in this region, Saint uh, de Quebec. And um, there was the whole, uh, um, let's say, media um, heat around this idea that just watch out, guys, it's everywhere. So, um, so I was so happy. For me, it, was, it, wor it would work because I was looking for this plan. And when I got there, the, my main problem to actually work on this project was to find a plant. I couldn't find it. I had to... One day, in one day, I had to drive like about 700 kilometers to actually find just one small colony uh, so far from the uh, Saint de Quebec. So that's also tell us um, how we perceive this otherness and this other gigantic other that uh, it's not necessarily as. Uh, frightening as we imagine it. No, it's not the threat that media and, and scientists uh, makes us ima imagine. And of, of course, the problem is serious. We're, we're not saying that it's minor and, and there's no threat. But um, it's, it's really a question of vocabulary. And it, it's also uh, a way to preserve environments. Uh, we're ready to eradicate these plants, so to really tear them up, so to destroy the ecosystems that is around the plant, to eradicate this special plant because we don't want it this year because it doesn't have the permission to stay there. So it, 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 is, it hasn't the visa for example. And so that, that's really absurd. And uh, I wanted to do, talk about the um, special ecosystem of the Fondation Grand Tam. The Fondation Grand Tam has been built uh, in, a, in a woodland, um, not wild, because it's in, in the middle of a region that is very agricultural, and the woodland uh, dates back from the 19th century, so it's not as wide as we think, but it's really preserved, and there's a, there's a little river, and there are woods, and you all or three of you stay there, and so you know the ecosystem, and there are no invasive plants there. It's, it's really well protected. Um, especially by the foundation. But what is the specialty of the ecosystem? Both of you, you studied uh, uh, really precisely the woodlands of the Fondation Grand Am and all the neighborhoods and all of its specificity. Can you talk uh, uh, to, to us about the specificity of the ecosystem? In French, either in English, as you want. Est-ce que des gens comprennent pas le français? Est-ce qu'il y en a qui comprennent pas du tout le français? If we talk very slowly in French, is it okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can speak in both. Uh, ben, je voulais juste commencer en disant merci à la Fondation là, de cette euh, belle rencontre. Et puis, j'aimerais aussi reconnaître euh, que je suis heureuse et reconnaissante de, de, de travailler et de vivre sur les terres euh, de la nation gagnante Kiraga. Alors, cette rencontre avec la, euh, la Fondation Grand Am, en fait, c'est est un long processus. Alors, on était là au mois de mars, 
euh, pour la résidence et c'était je dirais pas que c'est la meilleure période là, pour, pour étudier les arbres parce que d'abord, c'est difficile de reconnaître les arbres l'hiver avec juste l'écorce. C'est plus facile de reconnaître quand les, les feuillus sont là, les feuilles. Mais euh, je, je pense que c'est, on voit ça comme un, un long processus, donc euh, avec des retours ponctuels. Et la, la, je dirais que la vraie étude va se passer au moment de notre exposition, mais que nous, on appelle un laboratoire. Alors, on va vivre sur place au moment de notre, euh, euh, quand ça va être l'espace le, le, public. Et je crois que c'est là vraiment qu'on va euh, pouvoir euh, comprendre ou enfin sentir euh, quelle, est, quelle est cette région, euh, puis aussi à travers les saisons. Alors nous, on a la, évidemment la chance au Canada d'avoir quatre saisons, même si les saisons sont en train de se, euh, moins se démarquer, euh, de plus en, en, en fonction des changements climatiques. Mais c est, c est, je crois que la question de l'étude, c'est que... Euh, on arrive avec, bien sûr, l'expérience de la chaire de recherche et AE Lab, qu'on qu fait depuis le les, les milieu des années 90. Et puis, la chaire de recherche, c'est quelque chose qui est sorti d'une longue période de dizaines d'années où on a travaillé sur les matières résiduelles et la pollution qui nous a amené à, au changement climatique. Alors, ce n'est pas quelque chose qui est apparu. Euh, et puis, on n'aurait même pas pu dire, je pense, il y a même cinq ans, qu'on allait travailler sur la forêt. Euh, et c'est venu, c'est ça la démarche, c'est que ça, ça nous amène à faire des choses non planifiées. Et alors, euh, le fait d'être avec Grand Am euh, dans cette résidence et éventuellement le laboratoire public, ben, on va juste continuer à apprendre. Alors, euh, c'est l'occasion, c'est comme ça qu'on voit notre travail. Il faut dire que le, le cube de verre là-bas, euh, c'est une espèce de cadre architectural qui, qui amène à la, à la contemplation. Puis on, on était dans une période d'attente, en fait, euh, ou de longue attente de, de ch des changements, des saisons. Puis il y a eu toutes sortes de surprises tout du long pendant la, pendant la résidence. On a eu des averses de de neige collante, il y a eu toutes sortes de choses, mais là, on était, c'était la première fois tous les deux qu'on était dans, dans un cube de verre architectural, euh, tu sais, comme on les voit dans des belles revues. Euh, puis ça a été vraiment une expérience euh, vraiment, vraiment très profonde et avec beaucoup, beaucoup d'onirisme. C'est comme si on était dans une machine onirique qui a été, qui a été faite avec beaucoup de bienfaisance, euh, non seulement pour les artistes qui sont en résidence puis les, les gens qui font des expositions là-bas, mais pour tous les gens qui sont de passage par là-bas. Il y avait beaucoup de bienfaisance dans l'environnement. Euh, donc, c'est ça, on attendait, le, entre autres, une débâcle qui devait, euh, qui devait arriver du jour au lendemain. Euh, Michel, un des, de nos autres, euh, était vraiment... Euh, C'était vraiment une question à tous les jours, on s'en reparlait. Puis finalement, ça ne s'est pas passé exactement comme on, le, on, comme on le croyait. Nous, on était là avec des dispositifs de captation vidéo audio, comme un peu tous nos, euh, nos collègues qui font ce genre de choses-là. C'est un peu imprévisible de savoir quand les choses vont se déployer. Puis souvent, il y a des, il y a des choses qui se passent très rapidement. Il y a eu des migrations d'oiseaux, euh, des centaines et milliers d'oiseaux tout d'un coup qui apparaissent. Puis on est en, il y a encore de la neige. Puis en tout cas, c'est. Fait que ça a été comme un. Pour nous, c'était. Moi, je peux dire, ça nous a pris un peu de. Pas nécessairement par surprise. Je m'attendais un peu à quelque chose comme ça, mais je ne savais pas jusqu'à quel point on allait être complètement. Euh, dans cette espèce de machine optique, machine onirique qui était le cube de verre, puis comme de raison, on allait faire des marches à l'extérieur. Ce qui fait qu'on a, on a fait un peu de documentation, mais c'est une période dormante. C'est pas, comme disait Gisèle, c'est pas nécessairement la meilleure période pour être en contact puis pour identifier des choses. Mais par contre, on a, ça, on était comme dans un flux là, de, justement, de changement de, de saison, changement climatique. Puis, I have to precise for, for the public that the architecture of the Fondation Grand Tam is really special. It has been really created uh, recently by architect Pierre Thibault, and it's really uh, a, a square at the top of a canopy of the, of the uh, woodland. Um, you are uh, at, the, at the top of a terrain that goes really uh, deep uh, to um, the river, And so you're really at the level of the top of the trees. So it's really particular because you're floating um, when you're staying in this space. And it's, it's really uh, all glass. Everything is transparent. And you can really, really watch the uh, forest and uh, the top of the, of the trees, which is 
quite unusual, and um, and it's it's really special at each season. I never stayed there, <laughs> but I, I went there at different season, and I think this quality of observation is uh, quite particular uh, within the space because you're really in connection, but at the same time, it's a very modern, uh, super modern uh, architecture, and you you feel really in the uh, 21st century for, for, for sure, but you're quite in the middle of this woodland and it's really special. It's a really uh, humbling experience. Uh, if, if you stay there for a, a full month like that, for us was really more, uh, more of a, an humbling kind of a uh, posture. Uh, we're quite silent, we're really happy to be there and really happy to be in nature. And, uh, but the, the whole thing was more of a sense of respect or I don't know how to put it. And like you said, ultra-modernist environment. Uh, we discovered in five minutes that everything was really thought about, like everything was really functional for people to live there. And so that was really inspiring in other other way as well. Like uh, So anyway, like a, a little bit like being in a spaceship. Like I know other context of residencies that emphasize that type of uh, dislocation or or relocalization in you know different spaces, uh, like in spaceship a little bit, but uh, it felt a little bit like that. Yeah. Maybe I can just add that the um, the question of the forest, the uh, the analysis that we do comes from the scientists. So we do choose the theme together, uh, and each year we have a different theme, and we have not discussed yet the theme of 2023. So, um, so the, the specialists of the forest are the scientists, um, but, uh, not but, but and, the, the, the question is that how do we bring the scientific research into public space? And so, as we know with climate change, there's a, a, a predominant slogan, listen to science. Let's listen to science, listen to the scientists. And so this is what we wanted to do with this project. We wanted not just to listen, but to be with them, to go out in the field with them, to understand how they work. And in our practice as the, of the uh, experimental documentary is that that's what we've done for the last 25 years. So we go in these different fields, we accompany people, we look at how they work, how they do things, and then we bring that into an artistic expression. When you mean artistic expression, I'm, I'm curious about that because usually environmental issues mean a lot of data, a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, and um, how to um, make it palpable, emotional, um, really sensitive for the public, I think it's one of the challenge to, to make it not only reasonable, not, not only, okay, th these are the information, these is the knowledge I can get from an artwork, but it, it's about art. So how, how do you deal with this um, precious domain that is not only mediation, uh, it's not only mediating science, it's something else, making artworks. It's not, uh, it's not a, a scientific lesson. It's not, um, we're not going to class <laughs> when, you're, when we're visiting an exhibition. So how do you deal with this very delicate thing, very fragile thing, very, this equilibrium between science, knowledge, but also pleasure? And I think with environmental issues, pleasure is kind of guilty. Uh, it's problematic. So how can we can we be how can we enjoy something about environmental issue and find it beautiful when it's burning out outside? So that that's always this problem. How do we deal with all these factors? I know it's big. Okay. <laughs> well, for me, the problem is actually the most stimulating part of it. That that what is the problem is what enables us to. Um, consider, and I'm not saying the problem is strictly human, that there is a problem, okay, there's a huge problem, and which is climate change. I mean, I think everything is climate change now. But um, what does this problem engage us to think again, to do again, agir, comment peut-on agir uh, avec un problème? Alors le problème, on sait, c'est un obstacle. 
un obstacle qui doit faire en sorte qu'on remet en question nos manières de faire. Et um, and that's what I'm mostly interested in. Um, moi, je me, je me base beaucoup sur... Mais la question esthétique, pour moi, n'est pas juste la beauté. Ça serait un peu... Un peu réducteur. Réducteur. Donc, la question de l'esthétique, de pour moi, relève de la pensée de Jacques Rancière, qui parle de la notion de aesthesis, donc la sensation qui fait en sorte qu'avec l'art, on vit de nouvelles sensations. Et la sensation n'appartient pas au corps, n'appartient pas à l'humain, c'est quelque chose qui est un affect qui circule dans l'environnement. Alors donc, moi, c'est ça qui m'intéresse avec la notion d'être artiste, c'est qu'en fait, je, on propose des choses, mais ce n'est pas du tout dans une approche de démonstration, ça c'est le rôle de la science. Euh, en tant qu'artiste, ce qui nous intéresse, c'est de composer avec une série de paramètres, de situations et de voir comment on peut proposer de, plus, de multiples positions. Euh, et je dirais fondamentalement, moi j'aime bien dire aujourd'hui que les changements climatiques, c'est un climat changeant. Alors, quelle est cette opportunité pour changer? Alors, pas juste, euh, en tout cas, on va peut-être parler d'éco-anxiété, mais on a toujours une occasion de bouger et c'est ça qui m'intéresse avec ce grand défi des changements climatiques. Il y a la, on parlait de justement que les choses ne soient pas trop didactiques puis de ne pas se sentir « guilty » de tu sais, d'avoir de, euh, des expériences esthétiques ou d'être dans un milieu, par exemple, artistique et de côtoyer des scientifiques puis de poser des questions. Puis je pense qu'au final, c'est qu'il y a beaucoup de complémentarité dans les modes d'expression, mais aussi dans les modes de de perception, c'est-à-dire qu'on peut regarder les mêmes sujets. On est quatre, on est, on est 20, on est 40 autour de la salle. Ben, on peut tous ensemble faire un workshop pendant trois, quatre jours, puis on voit des choses différentes, puis ça, ça devient très, très riche. Puis c'est ce genre de, de c'est ce genre de situation là qu'on qu qu recherche. C'est-à-dire, c'est c'est comme si on, on déploie des systèmes d'observation, des de, pour absorber ce que la nature, ce que le, ce que l'environnement est, ce que sont, ce que sont que les problèmes climatiques, puis aussi l'extension de la nature, c'est-à-dire que la nature, c'est la pollution, c'est les humains, c'est tout ce qui est là, c'est vraiment l'écologie, c'est une écologie qui est très large, puis je pense qu'on se rallie tous autour de cette idée-là que la nature n'est pas séparée, que on est vraiment dans un prolongement qui est complexe, puis qui est pas, euh, c'est pas évident de se positionner. On est tous touchés par les injustices euh, qui sont faites au, euh, euh, envers les animaux, envers les différentes espèces, euh, l'espèce de phénomène anthropocentrique aussi, que ce soit les artistes ou que ce soit les intellectuels, ou euh, cette espèce d'obsession de, des humains à se mettre au centre, au cœur de, de toutes les conversations. Mais je pense que quelque chose qui nous rejoint justement dans le plaisir aussi, c'est la... Euh, c'est tout l'aspect physique. Dans mon cas, tactile, je travaille avec le son d'une façon un peu plus tactile, un peu plus physiologique. Puis d'amener les gens justement à, à vivre des choses qui, qui viennent induire des nouvelles sensations, qui viennent induire des nouvelles façons de, de, de faire des agencements d'idées ou des choses comme ça. Ça fait que ça, c'est un, un peu un plus. C'est un peu comme si on était avec un scientifique. Euh, qui, qui a un microscope et qui regarde le, le microscope pour lui-même de façon optique, c'est une chose de déployer cette image-là euh, à grande échelle devant des gens en temps réel, dans une expérience, par exemple, qui serait faite à, avec le public. On a vécu des choses similaires, puis on s'est rendu compte que, euh, ne serait-ce que d'amplifier certaines expérimentations qui sont faites à, dans une échelle de laboratoires de recherche individuels, tout ça, pour, avec un protocole qui est très euh, euh, clos, si on veut, au public. Ne serait-ce que d'avoir accès à certains dispositifs, des fois, on, nous, nous rapproche euh, de ce que c'est que la réalité à différentes échelles, puis tout ce genre de choses-là. Ça, c'est une chose qu'on a, a ça en nous, les artistes, puis on a ça en commun avec les scientifiques aussi. Cette capacité-là de transmettre, puis de vivre, vivre, voir des choses, regarder des phénomènes ensemble. Um, what you said was really interesting for me. The more problematic, the more stimulating. Um, I feel like the science, um, what you guys do and what I'm interested to do is that the science and data and all these information, 
becomes uh, the material that we can actually communicate certain uh, problems with the public that they are not necessarily scientists or they are not necessarily interested in science. Um, it enriched the project, it enriched the work, and I also like the idea of assetizing those data and um, make it something beautiful, actually, to in order to uh, create these sensations in in the viewers. For example, the project that I was worked on and uh, that I worked on during this um, residency at Grantham, I worked with the scientists and. The, the discussions that we had became a very important part of the project. The microscopic images, it was fascinating for me to see them, the colors, and I actually worked with them, uh, with those microscopic images, as a, a very abstract uh, images, you know, with uh, very lush colors and very uh, abstract forms that necessarily, if you don't know what they are, um, they, you're just going to look at it as a beautiful image. But the moment that you understand where they come from, it changes the whole um, dialogue between the work and the viewer. Um, you're basically looking at the grain of a super invasive plants. And next to it, you see um, the same family of this, this species, but it's, um, uh, it's uh, indigenous, it's like local. And you see there is no difference in this Yeah, the good and the bad are very close. Very yeah. close to each other. So for me here is like a, something that just helps us to reflect differently um, how we can deal with science and data, but from a very artistic point of view and make it somehow personal. Um, because when it becomes personal, I feel like that's the moment that it actually touches the viewers. Did you progressively feel a responsibility, Anaita, uh, defending this plant, being uh, a spokesperson for this plant? Was it uh, really a kind of mission at a certain moment of your residency and your research with the Persian Ogwig trying to rehabilitate the strength of this plant and have to um, also precise that Persian Ogwig in, in uh, Iron medical studies is a very powerful plant and it's studied in iron and China uh, very closely and uh, all the medical researches I read and it, this plant is astonishing and uh, so I was wondering did, did, did you feel like the advocate of this plant at, at the end of a project? No, I was more humble than that. <laughs> um, it was just uh, for me amazing to learn a lot through this plant and make me think of about a lot of things that they are basically the legacies of the histories that we think they are far behind us but we actually are living it every day in a daily basis um when my, when i was a kid whenever you have a headache or a stomach ache or you're tired my grandma would say take some gold pie you know like that was a medicine to everything uh, of course, there is certain sentimental value in what she was saying. There was not no scientific basis to that, but um, I feel like there is what maybe I learned the most through this project is that um, our relationship with, uh, in a traditional way of thinking, our relationship with the environment. Um, there was a time that the generations before us, they were living in the environment in a very, very close uh, contact. They knew the name of the plants that existed around them and they knew what kind of benefits come out of them. So just giving a name to a plant, it takes it, it makes it a friend, not a villain. And, um, and then this knowledge would just transmit from one generation to another generation. Um, through the fam, it's like a kind of like a legacy of a family that lives to the next generation. You, uh, and I feel like what is what we are living right now is just this um, point of contact is kind of missing and it's broken. So um, our relationship with the environment around us is kind of lost. And if you are looking for any kind of like a vegetables or any kind of herb, you go to the supermarket and buy it. We don't look for it. Uh, I don't want to be sentimental about it, but there is something important to think about because this kind of 
questions and way of thinking, uh, especially during this time, are very important because um, it defines our relationship with the with the environment. We talk a lot about climate change, and 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 I feel like by the time that it becomes a real problem, uh, sorry, if we, how can I say it? I feel like it's important before it becomes a real problem, we change this relationship with the nature. Right now, the way that we deal with the nature is, okay, we have these invasive plants, we have to eradicate them. So we put a lot of money on the eradication programs, um, but there are people moving all the time and we are damaging the environment all the time. So that's the best environment for the invasive plants to grow. I feel like we have like this kind of ethical and moral uh, responsibility to just step back and uh, rethink our way of relating in the war in general. Is nature there to serve us or we are collaborating with each other? Um, so both of us serve each other. And I think that's something that the traditional way of thinking was living it and was uh, having it in a daily basis and true uh, in the modern time, we just don't look at it. The nature has become a, point, a, uh, a source of exploitation, basically. I think you pinpoint something very, that is really essential right now. For the mutation of the relationship between art and environment, it's um, this alliance uh, working together, listening to uh, the, the living yeah, instead of nature, but uh, uh, try to be more... Um, accurate to the signs that are coming from the natural world and I, I think sound for this listening to try to be more connected maybe with the sound and, and not the vision and not in fact the knowledge but more the sentimentality the emotion I think it's one of the key of the the Mutation, the transformation of this relationship between art and environment. Less knowledge, but more sentimentality, more feeling. Try to feel more. And I think sound or music translation of climate change data, they are very important right now in, in the most recent years in the art production. And uh, do you agree it's maybe one of the key more listening, but also try to, to stay more connected with um, this unpapable, not visual thing, because it's, it's so visual. Environment is really linked to visuality, to images. We, we see a lot, tons of images, and, and they are creepy ones. And, and so listening to climate change, it's another thing. It's a try to identify what we're listening to. And even the month of March was not the most visual in, in the part of your work. I think it was interesting in terms of sound and in, in terms of listening, what is the change of the season. So I, I was wondering if it's one of the key. Yeah, but the, you have the, the uh, let's say the real time experience of sound or anything phys physical, like if, uh, je vais peut-être parler en français. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Euh, tout ce qui est très physiologique, tout ça, tout ce qui est en temps réel, mais il y a toute la, la codification, comme, comme on le sait, du, euh, de, de, des, des choses qui sont, qui sont regardées, qui sont vues avec les yeux, puis avec... Euh, euh, il y a une chose en particulier avec la, les changements climatiques, c'est les, les fameux graphes qu'on regarde euh, à tous les mois, tout ça. C'est un peu la même relation qu'on a avec la météo. C'est bon, on a des données numériques. On voit des graphes, tout ça, mais on ne ressent pas directement. C'est des choses qui sont encore très conceptuelles. Puis on ne ressent pas directement ce que c'est que, par exemple, la... par exemple, si on, on se penche sur le son, puis euh, un, je peux vous parler peut-être d'une expérience que j'ai eue à deux, trois reprises, parce que c'était les premières fois qu'on faisait des bandes sonores ou qu'on faisait des installations sonores vraiment à l'extérieur. Euh, un... il, il y a deux ans, on était, on était au Jardin botanique à Montréal, et puis, bon, ben, on arrive là, on, on installe un dispositif euh, qui se fond, ni plus ni moins, avec l'environnement. Puis, dans cet environnement-là, ben, du côté sonore, j'ai des corbeaux, euh, il y a des constructions, euh, euh, de la démolition sans arrêt dans la ville de Montréal. Il y a des gens qui parlent, 
il y a beaucoup de vent, il y a tout ça. Puis à un moment donné, moi, j'ai un dispositif avec des apports sonores, des apports musicaux. Puis c'est une chose d'installer ces choses-là, de préparer du son euh, pour écouter, qui va justement, qui va induire différents états de réflexifs ou des... Euh, mais euh, après quelques jours, on, je me rassois moi comme compositeur ou comme quelqu'un qui travaille avec le son, puis je fais simplement comme m'asseoir puis écouter ce qui est là, puis ça me dépasse parce que finalement, il y a de l'élévation, il, il y a tout ce qui se passe autour, il y a les interventions des gens eux-mêmes, il y a... Puis, ça a été pour moi, ça a été une expérience de. C'est ce que je reproduis maintenant, c'est que j'essaie de ne pas arriver avec des idées trop préconçues sur place. Puis j'essaie de, de, de m'asseoir un peu dans la musicalité de tout ce qui se passe autour. Ça peut être des éléments carrément dystopiques, ça peut être des éléments envahissants, ça peut être des éléments. Euh, par exemple, on était au cœur des sciences cet, cet été, puis bon, mais on a les, les sirènes, on a tout ce qui se passe, le festival. Euh, nous, on a des propos, on a des choses à dire, mais. Au final, ce que j'aime, moi, c'est de, de me fondre dans tout ça, puis de tenir compte de tout ça. Puis il y a peut-être une position où l'expérience va être plus optimale. Euh, pour l'écoute, par exemple, si on fait des, des écoutes avec plusieurs haut-parleurs ou ce genre d'expérience-là, mais on, 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 j'essaie aussi de déployer des systèmes qui sont plus tactiles, par exemple des plateformes où on se couche, puis on reçoit des vibrations dans le corps, tout ça. Puis on se demande un peu... Ce c'est quoi la relation avec le sujet des changements climatiques ou des arbres? Mais les, les relations se font un peu d'elles-mêmes. Les gens, bon, à travers les vibrations, tout ça, il y a toutes sortes de choses qui sont, euh, qui sont amenées. Puis après ça, on a des discussions avec les gens. Puis les gens eux-mêmes font des, toutes sortes de liens que j'aurais pu faire ou ne pas faire dès le départ. Tu sais. fait que, mais ce, cette, cette notion-là fondamentale de rejoindre les gens par des choses, des phénomènes en temps réel, que ce soit optique, visuel, euh, 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 tactile, pour moi, c'est quelque chose qui, euh, qui vient incarner tout ce qu'on a à dire, puis de, surtout de vivre des choses par rapport à... Puis qu'on se rend compte que les choses sont beaucoup plus... Euh, comment je peux dire? Pas nécessairement digestibles, mais c'est toute une question de temporalité. Et pour nous, il s'agit qu'il y ait un cataclysme ou qu'il y ait comme un, un problème environnemental soudain, qu'on se retrouve dans deux, deux mètres d'eau. Là, on va, il y a quelque chose qui se passe, mais sans ça l'appréhension de ce que c'est, tous ces problèmes-là, ben, c'est plus distendu dans le temps, puis c'est dans notre quotidien. Puis, ah, j'entends pas les mêmes oiseaux que l'année passée. Ah, il y a une disparition d'espèces. Toutes ces choses-là sont plutôt progressives, puis euh, c'est pas toujours cata cataclysmique, si on veut. Ouais. Gisèle, do you want to add something? Euh, oui, j'aimerais juste revenir sur la question responsabilité. Donc, euh, moi, j'aime beaucoup la pensée de Donna Haraway. Ce qu'elle dit, c'est « responsibility ». Donc, ce n'est pas « je suis responsable », dans le sens que je, « je suis le problème »,« je » en étant l'humain. Euh, je trouve que ce qu'elle m'a aidé à comprendre, Haraway, c'était la, la question du partage et aussi des paradoxes. Alors, donc, « to be able to respond euh, ». Franchement, euh, moi, je peux être la plupart du temps super déprimée à propos de tout ce qui se passe, mais l'art me permet d'aller à la rencontre de ces problèmes-là et de transformer, euh, d'apprendre des choses nouvelles, euh, d'aller sur les terrains, de recomposer avec, mais ça ne veut pas dire que c'est une solution. Alors, donc, la, la, la responsabilité est bien sûr le respect. Ça, c'est le respect. Pour moi, c'est ça que ça veut dire. Ce n'est pas une responsabilité, je vais dire, judiciaire. Euh, c'est une responsabilité qui parle d'un respect, d'un contact, d'une un, interconnexion, d'une euh, interdépendance. Et, et la question du partage, donc, fondamentalement, ben, on ne peut pas vivre sans les arbres. Mais je ne veux pas dire que ce l'arbre est, la, est au service de l'humain parce que ça, en fait, ça le rend es, esclave de notre réalité. Donc ça, ça ne m'intéresse pas du tout. Euh, mais en même temps, on partage cet espace avec l'arbre et l'arbre a toute son, sa propre manière de faire les choses. Alors, on peut parler de fonctionnement versus fonction. Donc si on pense que l'arbre est là pour nous soutenir, ben ça, c'est une pensée euh, vraiment extractiviste. Mais si on reste dans une pensée de partage et de fonctionnement, ben l'arbre, tout d'un coup, est, elle est, est, est source d'émerveillement. 
Et, et moi, c'est très important, ça, dans mon, dans mon art, d'être émerveillé par les choses et puis, en fait, de, me, de, me, de jouer sur mon individuation de cette façon-là, avec l'autre, pas, pas moi-même, c'est avec l'autre. Et pour reprendre, la, justement, l'idée la, du son, ou en tout cas, de tout ce qui est euh, euh, de la perception, bien, ça devient, on devient, on est en, est comme des in, une série d'interlocuteurs, c'est comme si les situations... On est en conversation avec les situations constamment. Puis plus on est ouvert, plus les choses sont complexes, paradoxales et tout ça. Mais en même temps, il y a une espèce de... Il y a quelque chose qui se passe. Il y a comme une, une ouverture puis une possibilité justement d'opérer de, des changements puis de ne pas être préconditionné si on veut. Surtout si on est en, en temps réel puis on a un peu de plaisir. Puis on est... Tu sais, c'est un peu comme aller danser ou écouter de la musique ou euh, euh, faire du sport, aller courir, tout ça. C'est des choses fondamentales. Si on, si on reste canté dans des idées puis qu'il n'y a rien qui bouge, ben c'est ça. Ça devient comme euh, sclérosé. Since two or three years, uh, most of art institutions, fairs, artists, critics, we all question our footprint. What do we produce? Should we print some catalog? Should we have a website? Because storage of data is as a real cost for the environment. So how do we deal with the, the effect of our presence or make people go to the Grand Town Foundation? It's one or driving uh, from Montreal. So it's, it's nothing technically, but it's gas, it's using a car, a uh, train goes to Drummondville, but not to Saint-Edmond de Grand Tam. So um, every, everything We, everything we make as a weight. So how do we deal with this anxiety? <laughs> how do you deal with this anxiety? How, how can we make artworks or catalog? Um, to, uh, it, it's, I think it's really difficult sometimes to think about what we are allowed to do now with the, the cri environmental crisis, environmental issues. Can we... Um, really uh, produce things, uh, t tangible things, material things? Um, I feel like uh, since these questions has become really important posed the last few years, uh, um, the media did a very good job making the populations very guilty, feeling about it. Um, As an artist or as a human before being an artist, yes, we're um, all human. we are just trying to be as careful as possible. You know, if we can take a public transportation, we do. If we can bike, we bike instead of driving. And we try to recycle, we try to do compost, um, we try to not to uh, use uh, AC uh, when we can open the you know, windows. So, we, like, we do a lot of things, but the huge uh, institutions and, um, and factories and in a governmental level, they are the most uh, sources of, like they are the sources of the most of the pollution that we are suffering. Um, I mean, I don't have any specific answer to this. I, I try to be a responsible citizen as well as a responsible artist, try to list as As, try to be just careful about these questions as much as possible. But I feel like there is a lot of guilt being injected to the society and most of the people, they are not necessarily responsible for the catastrophes that's no, going on. No, no, for sure. But I, I remember as a curator uh, in Toronto at the Ryerson Image Center, um, an exhibition about, about climate change and uh, most of a question from the medias were about good behavior or not. And I said, okay, I'm not going to preach. Uh, it's an exhibition about climate change, but it doesn't tell you how to behave and what to do. And for example, uh, exhibiting uh, photography, photography as a very, um, uh, uses pollutants, Uh, with all the chemicals you need to, uh, maybe not now with the, with the, the new prints, but it, it has a very 
uh, important footprint and it's not neutral. And even having uh, some, some letters on the wall, uh, it's really difficult to find the proper ink to print the messages on the wall. So there, there's no good solution, but I was really surprised because all the questions from the media and even from the public were about what, what can we do to behave um, more, um, to behave in a good way. And uh, I think it's very difficult to deal with this, even with the students when we teach. It, it's, it's a hard part of, a hard part of the job, I, I think, and it's more and more difficult to deal with this echo anxiety. Maybe uh, on our side, let's say people uh, working with uh, new technology and uh, hardware and software, and uh, I think what we learn now and what something that most of us knew was that the virtual or the uh, cloud aspect is uh, actually really pollute, polluting and that we have to, 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 uh, to think about that. So it's not because we're in front of a computer that uh, all of a sudden it's kind of crystal clear and it's blue sky forever. And uh, at the same time, I think mutualization of uh, resources, of technology, of simple things, uh, should be should be something that we have to concentrate on uh, as artists between artists and uh, with the public and I think there's been a lot of uh, different things with the that are happening with the DIY you know uh, type of uh, endeavors uh, the uh, fab lab and all those type of ideas and uh, to be a little bit more autonomous and to teach and to share uh, those type of views, and uh, that, that's for me, that's a way, that's an ecology in itself that has to be promoted, like to share, instead of just using and buying, and uh, so, and the notion of reuse for me is really something really magical, uh, like to, re to reuse a bicycle that is still good, and fixing it a little bit, and make it your own, or make it uh, as a gift for somebody, like I've been doing that a lot, and it's really, it, it's a symbol for me, like it's something really uh, uh, tangible and really joyful to, to do. And I think art could be the same, you know, like... Uh, uh of course, we're entangled in huge networks of um, trajectories of matter, of extraction, of exploitation, of waste. And um, I really think that we have to look at it like at a global level because it... it of course, there's the individual, and as Anaita was saying, is that it's always, you know, you do something in your individual practice, which of course we do, but at the same time, we need really bigger scale um, endeavors to be going on. And this has been also criticized by many environmentalists, is that the small by, you know, little by little is going to make change, yes, but now the scale of it is, has to be much bigger. So on that level, I would say we always have to look at the particular situation under analysis. We can't make any generalizations. And so each situation, so this is the, actually the con one of the concepts we're developing with the chair, which we call eco-technologies of practice. So what is that? Of course, we can say technology is a computer, but technology is the stage, it's your shoes, it's your shirt. Technology is all of that. So it's actually a, a craft, something that has been crafted. It's a connection between materiality and force. So I would say force in the sense of um, force en présence. And, um, and so we have, to, we have to consider all those things now. Each time we do, we make our work. And uh, I really um, think it's important to not have a prescribed way of this is good, this is bad, I mean, that's horrendous because that's really just like built, you know, pile on the guilt. Um, what's and, really and going a, on... And there is, is no uh, good and bad in nature. Yeah. If you observe phenomena, it's all there. There's a lot of answers for all the, the misbehaving or the misuse that we're doing of technology. Or, but the technology, technology is nature. Technology is us, technology is everything. So. So we can think exactly, let's say, techné, which is uh, 
a crafting, of course, and then logi, logos, which we've embedded in the human, but it's actually the human is in nature. So it's actually, again, the problem solving of the crafting of being in a place and being in a situation. So and in the sense that we, we think of the tree as technology in the sense, and, and that's really, you know, people have the idea that technique is diminutive and, oh, look, that's just technique and, oh, that's technical. But it's actually the core of everything we do because it's the way we've crafted our worlds and uh, the world has been crafted also through forces of, of others in human. And um, so it's very important for, for us to think of those things. So if we think of eco, which is a dynamic situation and technology, which is a link which becomes apparent through the actual um, practices that are united, the tree, the scientists, the artists, the, the publics that come and, and share with us their experience, well, that's, for me, a way <laughs> to do things that I don't feel completely SME and I, I can't do anything, so. Otherwise, we can uh, thank uh, Giselle, Stefan, and Anaita for this conversation, and I will thank you for being with us today. Thanks a lot.